as promised, today we will uh, screen the third part of the ontological imperative, a uh, report, documentary report, that I recorded a few years ago when uh, in St. Louis I had a, uh, a, a privilege of meeting uh, my three good, uh, I dare to say, friends, John Renzenbrink, Kevin Bryan and Charles Brown, uh, as they were um, attending a meeting of Green Party USA that was actually also connected with this election of the party candidate for the presidential elections. So that was an interesting uh, thing, but uh, during that time um, we focused on their discussion of the betterment of the world through the concept of the ontological imperative. And uh, that's what um, I'd like to present to you today, two earlier versions uh, two earlier parts of this uh, project are already on the channel, Ontological Imperative 1 and 2. And without further ado, this is the third part. Here we go. Yes, you're right. It? Yeah, I, 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 I think it may well be. Uh, yeah. Is that part of the campus too? You think? Or? I don't think so. Yeah. I think the campus. I think the border of the campus is right here. Or oh, maybe where that fence is, where we uh, went up to the the burial ground. You know? What is the beginning of dialogue? How do we get started? Well, I want to suggest that one way to get started is to recognize that the perspectives, our adversaries, our friends, and even ourselves are not monolithic. Even within myself, within a single individual, multiple points of view animate who I am, and they're often in tension. When I say me, I'm already presupposing a whole bunch of internal relations. Oh, yeah. Of course. See, see, that's no, what I'm trying I agree to get with at. That. Right. That, yeah. Well, that's what I'm trying to get I at. I know, but you yeah. see, the thing is, within me, for example, there is also, I think, I believe there is a center. And I believe that there's a center in you that I try to communicate with. And I think if I, what I need to do is um, acknowledge your being. We often think we lead with views. Most important thing to me is the person not that person's views. And that's a big difference, the difference between the map and the territory. The territory is that person. The map is the views that that person seems to have. The, the, the views that the person has change. Most people, over a period of time, change their views yeah. from 49% to 51%, and then it's changed. But the really important thing I'm talking about is not identifying with people's views and the pluralism of views, I'm talking about the plurality of persons to identify because persons are the ones who have views, not views having persons. It's as far as our society is going crazy with verbiology is that views have persons. And that's just a tremendous mistake. Okay, imagine that you can take a position on the bank of your own stream of consciousness and be the I want to say the spiritual eye that's kind of connecting experientially with what they call the Buddha nature. Oh boy, yeah. that's another whole discussion. Yeah. I don't buy it. Yeah. No, I don't. Yeah. I would say that we have to improve on, we, I mean, the world, has to improve on a very famous phrase from Immanuel Kant, categorical imperative. And I believe that we have to get beyond that, or it's too ethical in my mind. Yeah. What we need is, is what we need instead is the ontological imperative. Ontology is the science of being, and being is what I think our civilization lacks most of all. It does not have a sense of being. It has a sense of being other than being. So without being too crude, what the hell is an ontological imperative? It means that, that we are all related. 
But at the same time, I'm not saying that we are all one, because that would be another kind of ontological mistake. Do you use that phrase ontological imperative in your book? I do not. But I'm using it now because I'm, I'm, I'm trying it out on, trying it out on my friends to see what they think of it. Yeah, yeah. There really is a kind of an ontological imperative there. Uh, not some transcendent realm of being, but the concrete f flux of reality in all of its different dimensions, in all the interconnections that are at play with one another. You're, as, not, you're as, not saying that's what Emmanuel does. Oh, no, 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 no. That's what you're trying to suggest, yeah. I think, right? Yeah. We have to be on yeah. that. Yeah. 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 Because I, I think his way leads towards an overemphasis on ethics. being emerged from relatively unconscious nature and we began to realize that I am I. It was a heady, very heady experience. Very, very heady. And I know it's really very difficult to resolve that, that seeming contrariety or contradiction between self and the world. But because I am part of nature, and nature expresses itself through me and through all others, that I need to be fulfilled. That need to be fulfilled is, is life itself wishes to be fulfilled. Newton has, if you like, God, and there is a God for him, yeah. kind of intervenes in keeping the natural processes going because they run down a little bit, so God kind of, yeah, so, right. that, so there is a, a dimension of indeterminacy uh, uh, in Newton himself. But well, that's very by the time of, yeah, by, But by the time of Laplace, and I think that's what finally led to the, you know, the hardcore determinism where he uses that metaphor of the, imagine an intellect vast enough yeah. that it could comprehend in one instant all past states, all future states, down to the micro details. I want people who are willing to critically look at the views and the store of knowledge that they think they have. And once you can identify some kind of claim or set of claims that a person makes, say about, uh, about climate change, and we know there's a lot of so-called so junk science about that. If you can kind of adroitly bring out all the background presuppositions are made by those who say that climate change is a myth, if you can adroitly bring those out, you can disassemble that piece of false knowledge. And that becomes a paradigm of how to go about every other thing that you believe. If we can show the relationship between the immediate gratification, like you mentioned security, the specifics of one's life, you know, one's life, food, energy, education, these things, if we can hammer away at that, that this is what we stand for, that this ties in with their interest in their family and their life, and that gets back to me, right back to whether or not we have sufficient sufficient respect in our souls for people. And I don't think there is very much communication to most people to, in this society from politicians. And we have to be politicians that really do feel with the people. Even though this uh, thing was uh, recorded a few years ago, I feel that uh, it's, uh, it's important, at least for me, for some of us, um, to revisit. And uh, there is going to be one more part, which we will screen hopefully in the next uh, episode of Thinking Camera. Until then, be good. <laughs>